Thank you. I'm sorry I was running a little late tonight. My plane from Chicago, Chicago was a mess, uh, ran late, and I got lost as usual driving around uh, New Hampshire. But it's good to be back. Uh, the books to which I will refer tonight include Larry Lessig's book, A Republic Lost, and Peter Swicer's book, Extortion. Uh, I came to New Hampshire in the April month in 2011, running for president. I had not run for elected office in more than 20 years, and I had almost no name recognition. Who is Buddy Romer, people would ask. I further reduced the perception of my viability as a candidate by refusing all PAC money, something I had always done in running for office, governor and Congress. By refusing all corporate assistance, cash or information, by refusing all assistance from DC lobbyists, by limiting individual contributions to $100 per person for the entire cycle, and by requiring full disclosure of all assistance that we received. Now, I ran to win, not to make a point. Being relatively unknown is not a flaw or fatal in the early stages of a candidacy. In fact, early on, it could be an advantage. You can define yourself. I knew money would be tight, very tight. But money was my issue, and to run without special interest money would make me free to lead when I won free to build coalitions, free to actually solve problems. I thought that's what America needed in the gloomy days of 2010 and 11. I ran to win. I decided to use social media, a new phenomenon in America. It was powerful. And we try to use it to light revolutionary fires across a disillusioned and disgruntled younger population. Plus, I knew there was a key. There were already scheduled, when I announced for president, three, uh, three dozen nationally televised debates. Three dozen. They ended up being 42 in the Republican primary alone. And I'd always been good at that format. Not always a winner, but always competitive. And with a different message, money owns D.C., you don't, and a fresh face, I thought we could get 5 million Americans to do something they had never done before, give $100 to be able to speak with and be proud of a president. $500 million. I ran to win. I thought the Republican feel was decent but mediocre. I thought that my record was clearly distinctive from anybody else running. No one else, Democrat or Republican, made campaign reform an issue. None. My record was clear. I never accepted PAC money. I always instituted limits. I had taken campaign reform initiative in a state that had been far too tolerant of political corruption. I was the only candidate running who'd been elected a congressman and a governor. And I had always fought for campaign reform in both places. I had touched, smelled, and fought 
the corruption of Washington, D.C. And finally, I looked around me and saw where political corruption had led America. A capital addicted to special interest money and refusing or unwilling to deal with tax reform, energy reform, trade reform, bank reform, budget reform, or comprehensive immigration reform. All of these things need to be addressed and solved, but they will not happen without campaign reform. They will not happen without a Congress and a president free to lead. They will not happen unless we act first. That's what I thought, and that's what I think. Now, the party found a way to keep me off the stage. It was mighty interesting. In the early months, when no one knew me, my poll numbers were non-existent, and they had a ready excuse when I called before every debate. Well, buddy, if you just get your, oh, they call me governor. Governor, if you just get your poll numbers up to 1% or 2%, in the middle stages, when our social media had worked and our numbers began to rise, not big, 3%, then 4 they gave me an excuse in the middle stages that my fundraising was still too low to be a viable candidate. And then in the last months, they used an excuse. This is when my poll numbers reached 7% in the Gallup poll, ahead of six other Republican candidates. They used the excuse that I was the only candidate, even though I was the only candidate who had qualified for federal election matching funds, I had not been invited to the first 25 debates, so they couldn't invite me to the last 17. <laughs> so we were forced to pull out without a single debate to discuss the issue in this campaign. Reform of an electoral system that is controlled by special interest and politicians who seek re-election by deliberately not solving problems but keeping them alive. Oh, you need me, folks. I can solve this. Let me stay in Washington. I'm making progress. There are 145 elements in the tax bill that require an annual or every two year re-up, not made permanent, just so the politicians can, I think, extort money from those who give. I don't think that we can get this done without a couple of concrete plans of action. One, there are a variety of ways to climb this mountain. There's not just one way for campaign reform. I personally believe that we should not allow corporate contributions. I believe that we should not allow lobbyists to give money. I believe that super PACs ought to be outlawed. I believe that there should be an alternative for anybody who wishes to run for office with a $100 limit and a 5 to 1 federal match appropriated annually by the Congress, cheap for freedom, cheap for freedom. I believe there should be criminal penalties for those who violate these rules. <laughs> then finally, This has got to come from a combination of a leader that we choose who makes this the issue. And I don't know who that is, and we can't be worried about what party she belongs to or he belongs to. We can't be worried about region or color or education. We have to be worried about integrity and commitment. If this is going to be the top issue in America, we have to make it our top issue. 
All these Republicans can't just look for a Republican candidate. All these Democrats can't just look for a Democratic candidate. We have to look for the right candidate for our issue. Grassroots, grassroots. Now, this will be tough. We have a culture of corruption in Washington. I've been there, folks. I guess I might be the only guy on this stage who spent eight years in the United States Congress, didn't have a single fundraiser, didn't take a single penny of PAC money, met everybody who knocked on my office door, went four times for re-election when nobody ran against me, not one person. And the issue was not me. The issue was no money, and they knew it at home free to leave. It's not going to be easy. The politicians that I talk to, and I talk to many every month, excuse it, rationalize it, justify it, hide it. It's a culture. They have Lance armstrong it. <laughs> the only way to win is to take the dope. I don't want to do it, but everybody else does it. Read a book called Wheel Men. If you want to see what Washington, D.C. looks like, read Wheel Men about Lance Armstrong. Took dope from the beginning because it was the only way to win. That's Washington. They make money, not law. Nothing is permanently solved. I call it bribery and extortion. This morning in the Wall Street Journal, front page, that's my newspaper as a businessman, had a big picture of the former governor of Virginia, Bob McDonald, and wife. Now listen to this, and I quote, I wrote this down on the plane. This is the first paragraph of the Wall Street Journal. Ex-governor of Virginia, Bob McDonald, and wife, charged with using his office to promote the Virginia-based company Star Scientific, Inc. by arranging meetings for its chief executive with state officials and hosting events at the governor's mansion designed in part to encourage state university researchers to study the company's products. At the same time, authorities charge Mr. McDonnell and his wife Maureen solicited and accepted more than 135000 in loans and gifts. Guess what? That happens in Washington every day. Members of the banking committee didn't take 135000 from the big banks. Some of them took 435000 Everybody winking and nodding. And many of them, when they graduate from Congress, get a job with UBS or Citibank or Chase. To do what? To lobby their old members. You know what that's called? When your place in line is determined by the fact that you have to give a check, you know what that's called in America? Corruption. Do you know what it's called when the size of your check determines your place in line. It's called corruption. And that's where we are in America. A little bit at a time, winking and nodding, doing it because others do it, doing it because you have to do it to win. The most important thing to a member of Congress is re-election. He arranges meetings. You get him re-elected. He gets paid to do this job already at about $180,000 a year with all the power and the glory. But it's not enough. He wants your check so he can get reelected. The parties are just alike. Don't fool yourself. I've been in both of them. I know that's unusual. And maybe it'll make me disloyal. But I spent 25 years as a Democrat, and I spent 20 years as a Republican. And I can tell you, they both are well acquainted with the darkness of corruption. 
Where do they stand on campaign reform? I'll tell you what we need, and I'll close. We need an intervention. When you see somebody in trouble, when you see a nation in trouble, when you see a neighbor in trouble, when you see a son or a daughter, you step up, don't you? We've got to step up, New Hampshire. We've got to make this the issue. Now, there are many other important issues. Don't misunderstand me. Fairness, growth, comprehensive immigration, budget reform. My God. I'm not trying to take the money out of politics. I want to know how a woman running for Congress or a man can manage their budget. I mean, one of the most important jobs they do is deal with a couple of trillion dollars of our money a year. I'd like to see them be accountable and account for it. What I'm trying to do is disclose it and keep it out of the hands of the special interest. I think America has so much left to do. Stand up, New Hampshire. I think America needs to be strengthened in this fight. Stand up, New Hampshire. I think America has left so many of its citizens behind. Stand up, New Hampshire. I think America can sing and teach and lift and lead and dream again. But it starts here. It starts in New Hampshire. Thanks.